Hello, good morning. I hope you all can uh, hear me well. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Computer Science at the University of New Mexico. And today, well, I'm joining you from beautiful New Mexico. Um, I'm going to present to you some work in collaboration with uh, Michaela Toffer, Harold Weinstein, and several other collaborators, where the overarching goal of this work is the ability to perform in situ analysis of high throughput molecular dynamic simulations. In particular, to uncover conformational states of proteins that are crucial for their different functions. Uh, as such, I'm going to start briefly with a background in proteins. Uh, proteins are long chains of amino acids. Each amino acid is formed by an amino group and a carboxyl group and a side chain. They are joined by a central carbon atom uh, that is known as alpha carbon. So through my presentation, that atom is going to be of relevance. Multiple amino acids bond together to form polypeptide chains. And the part of the protein formed by the amino acid and the amino and the carboxyl groups is now, uh, known as the backbone of the protein. And when examining the structure of the protein, most analyses are going to focus precisely on the backbone. Now, proteins are not rigid entities. They fold and unfold through a variety of conformations to perform their functions. If we use an analogy with language to define protein structures, we can equate uh, letters with the primary structure. That means the long chain of amino acids. Words can be the secondary structure, like for example, the local domains that form with the, within the protein. For example, uh, helices and planar structures called beta sheets. Sentences can be the tertiary structure, the specific arrangement that the different domains adopt with respect to each other. Uh, finally, paragraphs are like the quaternary structure where multiple chains of proteins interact together. Through the talk, you'll see that uh, we care a lot about the secondary and tertiary structures of the proteins. So these little patterns that form helices and uh, beta sheets and how they arrange uh, with respect to each other. Uh, again, this is because we want to be able to perform high throughput analysis of molecular dynamic simulations with the goal of figuring out what conformational changes affect uh, which functions of the proteins. We want to be able to scale our analysis for the exascale area, and we want to be able to analyze these simulations as they are generated, rather than performing this analysis offline after the, simula after the simulations are done. So first, let us focus on identifying protein functions. Traditionally, uh, function prediction has been based on protein homology. You have a very large database of proteins, and you need to find out which of uh, proteins are similar, and, uh, and then you assume that once you find them, they will have similar function. This premise is not always valid, and as you can imagine, it can be very computationally expensive. An efficient way to find homology can be through sequence alignment. So nowadays, there are some very efficient methods to scale this process. However, the sequence is uh, fixed and does not consider the tertiary structure of the proteins. So it cannot be used for purposes of analyzing conformational changes because the, structure, the sequence is always fixed and it doesn't take into account the tertiary structure of the protein. Another method could be by using protein structure and alignment. But in this case, uh, proteins are messy. So they, you can imagine they look something like this, like a cloud of atoms. And they range in size from several hundreds to several thousand hundreds uh, of uh, atoms. So doing this um, uh, structure alignment is not easy. It is basically a, a generalization of a 3D graph matching or even partial graph matching that both are MP hard problems. So this is, a not, this is not an efficient way of dealing with this problem, especially not for in situ analysis. So the idea is we need to rethink the problem. We need to look at the proteins in a different way and maybe take advantage of uh, modern uh, analysis methods. To the naked eye, a protein, you can see diverse types of uh, patterns. Like, for example, here I have highlighted 
helices, the alpha helices, uh, beta sheets, and coils. So maybe we can rethink the problem enough so that we can use modern machine learning methods like, comp like convolutional neural networks or other uh, leverage techniques in image pattern recognitions, which can be executed very efficiently and accurately with modern machine learning. So how can we do that with uh, the proteins in an efficient way so that we can do this in situ? Well, first we need to look at the format of the proteins. Here I'm presenting to you three different formats, Cartesian representation, multifold representation, and surface representations. They are not adequate for image pattern recognition because uh, you may have occlusion, so depending on the angle that you're looking at the protein, you're not going to be able to see all of the tertiary structure. So for a computer, the tertiary structure will be lost. Uh, they are also not suitable for partial matching because of the same issue. So this format is not good enough for our purposes. So let's look again at what we need for this problem. We need a data representation that preserves secondary and tertiary structural information. And we need a method that does not require any sort of alignment to determine homology. That means to make global and local pattern uh, recognition easy, and that can be uh, very lightweight to be performed in situ. So first, let's focus on the first requirement, need a data representation uh, that is better for our purposes. Now, let's go back again to my brief introduction of uh, protein structure. We have secondary structure and tertiary structure. So secondary structure, you can see in the top part of my presentation. Uh, we have beta sheets uh, that are planar structures, and we have alpha helices, and we have many, many other types of secondary structures. But these are just examples of what they are. The tertiary structure is how these secondary structures align or arrange with respect to each other into a, a 3D, uh, into a three-dimensional uh, form. So we need to be able to preserve secondary structures, as I was saying. And so we can go back to the 1960s and look at the Ramachandran plot. The Ramachandran plot looks at what are the uh, torsion angles between the uh, amino group and the alpha carbon uh, denoted as a phi angle, and the alpha carbon and the carboxyl group denoted as a psi angle. So this, if you see in the top, in the bottom corner of my presentation, those are torsion angles that uh, figure out how those particular um, atoms arrange with respect to each other within an amino acid. Uh, the Ramachandran plot, this little square on the top uh, uh, corner of my uh, slide, tells you, depending on the value of phi and psi, whether that particular amino acid belongs to an alpha helix or a beta sheet or a coil or a gamma turn or several other types of uh, secondary structures. So we can use this knowledge for each amino acid to figure out whether they are, uh, what type of secondary structure they are. We also need um, we also need a, uh, an encoding that preserves tertiary structure. So we can look at the distance matrix of the protein. And I was talking to you about uh, the backbone of the protein and um, that is formed by alpha carbon. So this distance matrix is usually uh, computed by looking at the distance of each of the alpha carbons in the, in the protein and measuring their distance in angstroms. So everyone, every row and every column in this matrix, in this square that you can see in my slide, is an alpha carbon, and every pixel in this image is the distance with respect to each other of the other alpha carbons. That's why you can see a very dark line in the diagonal. That's just the same alpha carbon with each other, which distance will be zero, and then the light areas in the image are distances uh, that are farther away. So we can put those two things together and form an encoding that is a better representation of the protein. So what we have here is we start with the original uh, 3D protein, so the cloud of atoms that I showed at, 
at some point in my presentation, we can compute the distance matrix for that protein. So for each uh, alpha carbon in the residues of that protein, we are going to measure the distance with respect to each other and form this matrix. And then we can use the Ramachandran plot to figure out to which secondary structure each one of the residues belongs to. Is it an alpha helix? Is it a beta sheet? Or is it something else? At this point, we are only interested in three different secondary structures, so alpha helices, beta sheets, and anything else. And we encode them into three different channels in, in an image. So we use red for alpha helix, blue for beta sheet, and green for everything else. And so we use an RGB image to encode the whole protein. So the color of the image is going to be the secondary structure, and the intensity of the pixel is going to be the tertiary structure. So we are trying to preserve both secondary and tertiary structure of the protein in this encoding. This is an example just for you to see how expressive this encoding it is. So we have our uh, three channels, and in the bottom part, we can see for in red the two helical domains, A1 and A2 in the protein, and then you can see in blue all the planar uh, beta sheet structures that correspond to that protein. So even visually for a trained eye, it is possible to see uh, kind of what is the conformation of the protein from this little encoding. These are some other examples just for you to see what are the differences of uh, our encoding with respect to other types of proteins, other uh, different structures. You can see the symmetry. You can see, uh, for example, where different types of coils occur, where different uh, helices occur, and so on. Another, another set of examples just to observe the symmetry of the proteins. And so with that, we were able to encode a, a wide variety of proteins, basically all of the proteins that are in, PDV, in the PDV data bank. Uh, let's go back to our requirements. So I just talked about the data representation that preserves secondary and tertiary structural information. Uh, and second, we need a method that does not require any sort of alignment to determine homology so that it makes global and local pattern recognition easy. And I hinted earlier to the use of convolutional neural networks. Uh, at this point, we did not want to use a very deep convolutional neural networks because they will try to overfit too much to our problem. We were able to use about uh, 150,000 proteins for training, but that's not enough for very deep neural networks. So what we did was to design a shallower type of network. It's still a convolutional neural network, but it's a split input. That means we have one input for each one of the channels so that we can extract information that is of relevance of the different type of structures. Again, we had in red uh, alpha helices, in blue beta sheets, and in green any other type of secondary structure. And it's a, it's a ResNet, so we pass um, information of the input to further layers in there. And it had only a few convolutional neural networks, I believe only one or two convolutional layers, and then a final um, a fully connected layer. So it was a very small uh, neural network, precisely because we wanted to avoid overfitting. So for a proof of concept, I'm going to show you what we did for performing protein fun function prediction. But remember that our goal is to be able to apply this for uh, analysis of protein trajectories, so folding of proteins, not just uh, function prediction. So we use uh, 73,000 uh, proteins from the PDV. We were able to get uh, eight different uh, functions using the go terms of the proteins. And I'm not going into details because the next part is what I'm more interested. It was a wide variety of proteins with very different types of resolution, very different types of sizes, different types of um, source organisms. And our network was able to achieve above 80% of accuracy. Uh, we compare with other types of architectures that were 
not better than 50%. So we were very happy and we think that this error is expected given that proteins have multiple types of functions. So that that was uh, good enough um, um, proof of concept that we were able to preserve uh, information that was useful for identifying protein function. But what we really care about is for protein folding analysis. Um, in, situ simul in situ analysis of uh, molecular dynamic simulation. So as I was saying, proteins fold, they don't stay in their um, uh, particular conformation too long, they move and then they perform their functions like that. Um, fortunately, presenting to you a PDF, otherwise you will be able to see in the bottom part how the different trajectories change with our encoding. So for high throughput analysis, if we were doing homology, uh, that is this uh, top part of my image, so where you can see homology-based prediction, we can have an offline aspect of it and online aspect of it. For homology, you will need to be able to perform it in situ, you will need 50 gigabytes in RAM just to keep part of the database in memory and then uh, perform 3D graph matching or partial 3D graph matching over all of the structures, with, uh, which I already said that is an MP uh, problem. With our technique, we only need 70 megabytes in RAM and we can perform our encoding in a uh, order of the size of the protein, which in practice is uh, about less than two seconds in commodity hardware, is much faster in supercomputers. And then we can perform a prediction that is uh, constant time. So our network is very small, so this can be done in um, a few seconds in a commodity hardware or uh, less than a second in more sophisticated hardware. So I'll show you uh, our first case study. We were looking at opsin. Uh, opsins are a group of proteins containing seven transmembrane alpha helical domains connected by three extracellular and three cytoplasmic loops. So these are the, cell, the uh, alpha helical domains, if you can see the different helices, and the loops is what you can see in the top and the bottom part of the image. You can see extracellular on top and cytoplasm on, on the bottom. Uh, they belong to the G protein coupled receptor, GPCR, and the structures of activated uh, GPCRs indicate how uh, li ligand binding at the extracellular side, so when a li ligand binds in the top part of the, of the opsin protein, is going to generate a, a movement, an outward movement, of the bottom part of the protein, here what you can see in red, TM5 and TM6, is going to have an outward movement when something binds in the extracellular part of the protein. And that movement has been, uh, is, is, is of a lot of interest for, for scientists to, to figure out the, the function of this protein. In the, in the right side, you can see our encoding for this protein. Every red segment, is one alpha helical domain joined by the little loops. So what you can see as little yellow and little blue, that's, those are the loops in the diagonal of the image. You can see in here in a square, um, the little loop that I have highlighted in red in the left, that is the loop between TM5 and TM6. And what we care about is the outward movement between TM5, TM6 with respect to the other loop that is in here in the, in the bottom side of the protein. And that is going to be seen as uh, a, something happening in offline of the diagonal between those two loops. I'm going to show better in uh, a further slide because I don't think you can see my cursor. So when we perform the simulations for opsin, uh, you can see in the bottom part is when uh, this outward movement is not happening. We can see the two, it is a zoom into this little loop, into this, this little red area. You can see that it's just all red, nothing is happening. But then as uh, this outward move, move, movement starts occurring, uh, 
you can see the prevalence of yellow and red and magenta in there. So that is already uh, telling us that the loop is, unro is uh, unraveling and something is happening. Um, we also wanted to see what other insights or network is giving us, specifically by looking at the activation map of the network, that is the parts of the image that are the most relevant for the, um, for the network to figure out what's the function of the protein. And in this specific, if you can see the intersection of these two squares, this little line, this little intersection, that's what we really care about when this outward movement is happening in the, in the protein. So it's going to be, we are hoping that this area is going to be highlighted by the network as something important, something relevant that is happening when the trajectory is performing this outward movement. So we look at the activation maps. So we basically follow the gradient of the network backwards to figure out an explanation of where the network is looking at. You can see in the blue squares, that will be the areas of the image that are activating our network the most. And I hopefully you can see these little dotted lines. So the two of them are important for this outward movement. At the beginning of the simulation, you can see that the second line is not activated at all. But then as, as the outward movement starts happening, the network starts focusing on that area specifically, and it ends up highlighting those two areas uh, very well. So we were very happy to see that the network was actually looking at the regions of the protein that we were expecting to see when this outward movement was happening uh, for uh, docking of the, of the protein. Another case study that we have for our uh, approach is uh, using GLTPH. GLTPH is an aspartate transporter. So it is a bowl shaped homotrimer. So that's a protein composed by three identical units of polypeptide called protomers. Protomers in GLTPH exhibit a rigid move body movement sometimes called an elevator-like motion that is considered a crucial part of the transport cycle. So if you can see the protein in here in the membrane, this blue, uh, light blue, that's the protein, that's GLTPH, it sits in the membrane, so it's a transmembrane protein. And so when the substrate comes, uh, one of these um, protomers, if you can see the three, the three bowl shapes, the three little heads in the protein, that's the protomer, is going to grab the substrate and move it from one side of the membrane to the other side. So that's going to be the elevator movement. So grabs the substrate and moves it from one side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane. So we wanted to see if our encoding uh, or for methods were able to see this movement. So you can see the three protomers in here very clearly. And in our representation, they show in the diagonal as these three big squares. Now the interaction between each one of the protomers with each other is seen off the diagonal. So the squares that are off the diagonal are the specific interaction. For example, we have protomer A, B, and C, just labeling this slide. And so the off the diagonal AB will be the interaction of protomer A with uh, protomer B. AC will be A with the C and BC, B with the C again. So we can look at just how those particular regions of the um, image change to identify when the elevator-like movement is happening. In this case, you can see time series of the intensity of those regions with respect to each other. And we were able to identify two regions um, where everyone in the bottom are like different frames of the simulations, two regions where the elevator-like movement was happening for uh, Protomer C. So we were also very happy to see that our, our methods are able to capture not just local type of patterns, but also global type of movements in, our, in the proteins that we were um, evaluating. And as you can see, this one is much bigger than the opsin protein that we, we saw before. And we use exactly the same method, exactly the same network, and everything just work fine. 
So as a conclusion, our encoding produces homogeneous images regardless of the size and characteristics of the proteins. Once in the image or tensor format, the data is suitable to be used by a wide variety of image processing or machine learning methods. And it has a lot of applications for function prediction and analysis of uh, proteins, um, docking and folding trajectories and so on. So I would like to thank my collaborators and my students that have been working on this project. And if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer anything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Truth. It was uh, really enlightening, uh, a very new way of looking at uh, protein folding from numbers. And now we invite the audience to ask questions. We have a first question. I see one in the chat. Yes. Will it make sense to treat the folding process as a series of images and use some type of recurrent neural network to predict every every step of it? Yes. So some of our work right now is in the use of uh, long short term memories. We also try recurrent neural networks and we are looking at autoencoders to figure out different um, to figure to try to identify automatically the different conformational states of the protein. So yes, that's definitely uh, part of the direction that we are going to. So yeah, our, our hope with recurrent neural networks is that they are going to be able to keep track of temporal information. At this point, we are still trying different things, but yeah. My main takeaway from this is that even though we have now uh, deep convolutional neural networks and they are doing uh, a lot of advances here and there, it is not true that they should just be getting your data without any sort of pre-processing. So every, every time everybody says like, oh, let the network find out the features. But if you don't have the millions of uh, instances, the network is just going to overfit. So it is very important to figure out how to expose uh, characteristics of your data that can be better used by your machine learning techniques to uh, figure out your problem. So I think the main implication of this is we need to have better re data representations. And then using machine le learning techniques can become very natural for that. Well, I might uh, add that I'm really amazed by uh, your results. I think I think it, uh, I need a little bit of uh, the, for it to sink in. But uh, reducing complexity from NP to constant, I've never seen anything thing like that. So well, it's because we train the, the network offline. Of course, the training of a network can be an NP. Uh, problem, but because we train it offline and that can be done very quickly also. I mean, it took us about uh, 45 minutes to one hour just to train the network. But once it's trained, we can just use the train model and we wanted to use a very lightweight model to do the prediction. Well, this is a great work. Uh, I need to congratulate you for that. We'll have Thank you very much.